But now we are learning the commandments in this week's Torah portion. This week's Torah portion is called Emor. And it begins with, you know, about 30 commandments that deals only with the Kohanim, the priests, and then some, some about the sacrifices, what have to be done, have to be done in the, uh, the, the Holy Temple, and blemishes on the sacrifices, and also blemishes on the coin. And we didn't go all through all the blemishes of the Kohanim and of the sacrifices. Maybe we'll go through a little bit. But they're very strange. There's blemishes on the eyes and in the nose and in the ears, the hands and the feet, the hair. Huh? These blemishes, you know, if the hairline is down too low or if the, the eyebrows, they meet together or whatever. So all these things that disqualify a coin because the coin is supposed to be a, um, like a, a, a perfect example of a human being. So not an imperfect example of a human being. It doesn't really make any sense, but that's what God decided. So like I say, the whole world doesn't really make that much sense. You know, why people have only two legs, why not four legs? Why? And so that's what God decided. Okay. And then there were a lot of laws that we had relating to uh, the Kohanim. So let's do a few laws. And then the end, it ends with a lot of laws about the holidays. The holidays, all the very, various different holidays. So let's go through a few of the holidays. We've already, there's 63 holiday, uh, commandments. In this week's Torah portion, some are positive, some are negative. Let's see, how does it go over here? We have, uh, just one second, I'll tell you. 40, I'm sorry, 39 prohibitions, 39, count them, 39 prohibitions, and 24 positive commandments, things that you have to do. Okay, so let's, let's go through some of these. Ready? Here we go. So we said a Kohen can't have a blemish, can't be a blemish. The animal can't be blemished. You bring it to the end the sacrifice. These, of course, are only relevant for the time of the temple, but Mashiach is going to build the third temple. There's going to be more sacrifices. So positive commandment that the carb, that the sacrifice has to be at least eight days old. All the seven days, it's called mechusar zaman, a baby, animal. <clears throat> and um, you can't, if you sacrifice, there's no punishment, but it is not considered to be a sacrifice. No good. All the things that were done, all the command, all the blessings that were made, all sorts of blessings, were, uh, uh, you say, <clears throat> taking God's name in vain. Because you didn't do a commandment, you took it. Next. Eight days, yeah. And you can bring sacrifices for the non-Jews, but the non-Jews, when they bring a sacrifice, it also has qualifications. It cannot be blemished with all the blemishes, most of the blemishes of, of the Jews. There's certain exceptions. But anyway, there has to be, you'll, you'll read the laws. When the Holy Temple comes, all of you Gentiles out there that want to bring sacrifices Read up on the laws before you bring them. Or don't bring up the laws, but don't be surprised that the coin rejects you. It's not because he is bigoted or something like that, and he doesn't like non-Jews. Non-Jews can bring sacrifice. Not all the sacrifices. There, of course, is a big difference between Jews and non-Jews. That's the way God made it. I didn't create the world. That's how he made it. Okay. Negative commandment. Uh, yeah, six days. Eight days. That's what we said. Negative commandment, not to slaughter, though not the slaughter, even for eating. Want to eat an animal? No problem. You have to slaughter it first. If the ritual says a lot of laws of slaughtering, how to slaughter an animal, exactly how it's done. A bit complicated laws, but not insurmountable. But if you do slaughter an animal, you are not allowed to slaughter that animal and its mother or its child <clears throat> on the same day. Like it says, sure, you're not allowed to slaughter an animal and its mother or its child on the same day. In other words, a mother and a child cannot be slaughtered on the same day. This doesn't make any difference if the child is a male or a female. 
but the law is especially to the mother, because you can be sure who the mother is. You're never really sure who the father is. And if you are sure, even if you are sure who the father, let's say the father and the mother were locked, the cow, male and the female were locked together in a barn, not, nothing, no ever, nothing, I'm sorry, no other strange male ever got in there. So it's also forbidden to slaughter the child with a father together when you know that that's a father, but it's not as severe. There's no punishment from the Torah. Okay, let's see. If you do slaughter, we're talking about even now, you slaughter a mother and its child together or the child and the mother together, the punishment is lashes. Of course, you have to be warned and there has to be witnesses, and there is no lashes today. And but but the meat is kosher. So who gets exactly uh, beaten? So let's say you slaughter the mother, and someone comes along on the same day and slaughters the son. So the second person gets punished, not the first one. Okay, a lot of different details. Very interesting. Only the mother and the son, but the father and the son. It's forbidden. It's forbidden to slaughter the father. And its offspring, son or daughter, makes no difference, on the same day, same day, it's forbidden, but there's no punishment. Why? Because there's a little bit of a doubt if it's really, if the commandment is, the, is relevant to the father or no. Even though the language is in masculine, it says, sure, it says him and his son, his, it says, Masculine, but nevertheless, the rabbis learn. That's why you can't take the Torah. You can't interpret it on your own. You have to see how these other rabbis really chewed this thing up. And so all of the different arguments from all sides. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Negative commandment. Not to do anything that will result from it a desecration of God's name. Chilul huh? means to make mundane. It also means to empty out God's name. So you see a rabbi driving his car on Shabbat, so you know that Shabbat is not so important. Right? You see a Jew eating not kosher food, so you realize that this whole business of kosher food is just, you know, only for fanatics or something. That's called a chilul Hashem. Chilul Hashem. You see a very important uh, Talmudic scholar start screaming at someone in the end of the street. You see the guy lost it. So what's the big deal from learning the Torah? See, this man is just like, you know, he's just like a, a, a like a, what do I say, a, a savage. Or you see sometimes these important rabbis or whatever important that they get caught cheating or stealing or lying or something like that. And that's called Chilul Hashem. You're not allowed to do it. It says that there's, <clears throat> there's really three aspects to this. Two of them are in general and one is in individual. In general, it means that anyone that is being forced to transgress one of the commandments of God, if it is a time when let's say the church is doing it and they want you to do something small, right? Uh, throw down your tefillin on the ground, a little, right? But if you know that the reason they're doing it is to show that the Jewish people don't really think the Torah is important. But they tell you to eat not kosher food. So you don't have to give your life for not eating not kosher food. But if it's a time when there will result from this a desec what's called a desecration of God's name, that everyone will say, ah, the Torah of a mitzvah, that's just some guy made it up or something. <clears throat> you see these big rabbis, they don't really pay attention to it. So sometimes even if your life is being threatened, if it's in front of a lot of people, and there will result from this, you're advertising that God is not important. Or let's say they say to you, worship idols, right? Go into the church and bow down or we'll kill you. Or Gile Arias, they say have relations with a married woman or with an animal or with a, a man homosexuality or we'll kill you. Or they say you kill somebody else or we'll kill you. So you, even if it's in, in private, these three things, right? Forbidden sexual relationships or worshiping idols, or killing someone, essentially it means killing a Jew. 
the only Jew. You are supposed to give your life and not do it, even if it's not in front of anybody. But the other command, other things, even if it's the smallest thing, if it's the time when, let's say, the church is trying to show everybody how uh, the Jews don't really respect the religion, and even the smallest thing, they tell you to eat a cheese sandwich, what is that, the, the, uh, a cheese and meat sandwich together, milk and meat together, which is only forbidden from the rabbis, nevertheless, you have to let yourself be killed, because it's an obvious desecration of God's name in public. Uh, not an easy commandment. That's one of the things they tell converts when they want to convert. They tell them, listen, you know, now you can eat whatever you want to. You can accept, you can't eat a limb from a living animal, but you can, except for that, you can eat crabs. You can eat anything you want to. And you can smoke a cigarette on Shabbos. What's wrong with smoking? Is it lighting a light on Shabbos? What type of a, that's a sin. Lighting a light on Shabbos, the nicest guy in the world. He lights a light on Shabbos. It's punishable by death. What did he do wrong? He says, well, my friend, if you want to become a Jew, that is punishable by death. So we advise you, don't become a Jew. The whole thing is just trouble for you. Everybody's going to hate you. And for absolutely no reason. And you might even have to give your life for you know, a very insignificant thing, right? Bowing down to an idol. What could possibly be bad about bowing down to an idol. What could be buying? Well, are you just bowing down? What's the big deal? It says, no, you got to give your life. So they say to a convert, do yourself a favor. Don't get yourself in this crazy situation where you might have to give your life for a little nothing. Right? But the fact is that Jews do have to give their life away for these three things. Okay, there's a lot of different details to it, but especially these three things, Avodazar, idolatry, and bloodshed, those three things a Jew is supposed to give his life rather than do. Interestingly enough, the Israeli government includes encourages all these three things. Idolatry, the whole world, they fill the whole country with all these missionaries. Gilearites, they have all these bizarre, decadent parades, all these LG, whatever is parades. And they're arming the Arabs, they're arming the terrorists. They let them shoot missiles at us, and they encourage them. They give them land and everything like that. Okay, let's not get political, but nevertheless, these three things a Jew is supposed to give his life from, and there we have the the, the commandment in this week's Torah portion. Next, the positive commandment, the Kaddish is a Rabin. This was the negative side of it. You're not allowed to desecrate God's name. And this is the positive. You are supposed to sanctify God's name in public. And that's the, if you want to call it the positive side of, yes, you must give your life. This is saying that even if they say they're going to kill you, but nevertheless, you should not desecrate the God's name. It's a prohibition. Do not desecrate God's name. Don't kill somebody or worship idols or whatsoever. Even if they say they're going to kill you, don't do it. And here is a positive commandment. Do give your life. You are commanded to give your life in order to sanctify God's name, especially on these three things. And other things, like I said, if it's a public time and they, they, they're trying to make you publicly, you know, do something against the Torah, as you're supposed to give your life, Kiddush Hashem. This also includes, Kiddush Hashem means doing something really good in front of everyone for the sake of God. You're doing it for the sake, Kiddush Hashem, right? A person is willing to give up his money, his time, but to help others to... Uh, to save others, said Kiddush Hashem. We see now in Ukraine, right? All these Jews are running around. So they're, they're, they're in trouble. So the Chabad houses are helping all the Jews and they're saving the Jews and they're this. You know, there was some even big, uh, you know, very, very anti religious Israeli politicians that praised the Chabad, the Jew they were helping in over there in the Ukraine. I have to give, take my hat out for them, take my hat off for them. Don't take off your hat. Put on that. Anyway, great. Let's go. Positive commandment. Okay, now we're going to start with the holidays. You have to rest from doing work on the first day of Passover. Positive commandment. Just do a few more of these. You have to make a sacrifice in the Holy Temple, what's called an additional sacrifice, all of the days of Passover. A positive commandment, you have to rest, not do any work, forbidden to do work, 
It's a positive commandment to rest from work on the seventh day of Passover. Positive commandment to sacrifice what's called the Omer. Uh, we're now doing Sferat Omer, the day after Passover, the day after the first, first night of Passover. After the first day of Passover finishes, first day of Passover, as soon as the second day of Passover comes, the night with in Judaism, the, the 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 date starts in the night when the sun sets. So the, and when the sun sets on the holiday, on the first day of the holiday of Passover, then you do what's called Sphirat Omen. You count the day and you count 50 days. 50 days, seven weeks. There's a question if you're counting the days, if you're counting the weeks, but nevertheless, you count them all. You count the days and the weeks. But before that, you offer up what's called an omer. An omer, you take barley from the field. It's a whole big process of how it's done. And you bring it to the holy temple and you um, you burn it. And part of it is eaten by the kohanim. Right? Only a small amount is, is burned. And the shah and the rest of it, like a one handful, is burned on the altar. With a little bit of lavona, there's a special incense that's put there, and all the rest is eaten. Eaten, this barley is eaten by the kohanim, like all the bread offerings. Okay, negative commandment: not to eat any of the new produce, produce, wheat produce, before this omer is brought. Omer, the word omer means a bundle, a bundle of sheet, a bundle. A bundle of wheat. Before this bundle of barley is offered in the holy temple, the day at, the first day of the the sorry, the second day of Passover. Okay, good. The first day of Passover is a holiday. The second day of Passover in Israel is not a holiday, and outside of Israel is a holiday. But nevertheless, that the night beginning the second day of Passover, that's when this omer is gathered up together and it is burned in the next day, etc. And you start counting. That's when you start counting the Omer. All right, let's go to the, let's do a couple more commandments. Here we go. To count seven weeks on this Omer. Okay, so first is that you have to bring this Omer and Start to count on the first night here and all the other 48 nights, altogether 49. You count seven complete weeks, and that comes to the holiday of Shavuot, which we'll get to in a moment. That's the holiday when we commemorate the giving of the Torah. And it's a positive commandment to bring on the day of Shavuot, you bring two loaves of bread to the Holy Temple. The holiday of Shavuot in the Torah is called Atzeret. Like it says, we grab them min chachadasha l'Hashem and Moshe v'Tehem to view lechem tenufa shtayim. You have to bring two loaves of chometz bread. Usually, you never bring chometz uh, leavened bread into the holy temple. And this is one only exception. The only other exception is the Thanksgiving offering. Positive commandment: Don't do any work on the holiday of Shavuot. The holiday of Shavuot is fifty days from the holiday of Passover. This is when we celebrate the giving of the Torah. Don't do any work. You're not allowed to light fire, etc. You can cook and things like that. You can do for the necessity of eating. P negative commandment: Don't do any work on the. One second. Oh, it's okay. The negative commandment. First of all, we have a positive commandment to rest from work on the seventh. On, on Shavuot, that's positive, rest. And negative, don't do work. So if you don't do work, you get, it's like you're doing two commandments. You're resting, positive. This is explained in great length in other places. We're just going over in a very quick way. Positive commandment, to rest from doing any work on the first day of Tishrei. What's the first day of Tishrei? Rosh Hashanah. This is Rosh Hashanah. It doesn't say anywhere in the Torah. Okay, Rosh Hashanah, exactly what the holiday this is, but that's called Rosh Hashanah. That was the day that man was created, by the way. Man was created on this day. Six days of, sixth, the sixth day of creation. That's a holiday in Judaism. The, it's called Rosh Hashanah. New Year's. It's not called New Year's, it's called the head of the year. 
Like it says, Bechodesh Ashvi, Bechodesh Ashvi, Mika Kodesh, it's holiday. Negative commandment. Don't, the positive commandment is to rest. Negative commandment, don't do any work on the first day of Tishrei on Rosh Hashanah. That's the day when we sell the shofar, right? Positive commandment to make a sacrifice, and what's called a musaf, an extra sacrifice on Rosh Hashanah. Positive commandment to fast on the 10th day of Tishrei. What's that? That is Yom Kippur. Positive commandment. Negative commandment, do not eat. So it's, this, it's doing the same thing, but there's a positive side that you are fasting, and the negative side is that you are not eating. So it gives, it's like doing two commandments. Uh, there's also other things that are forbidden on this day of Yom Kippur, and that is wearing shoes, and because it says, Ini temet they learn it a long way. How, how they learn out what's forbidden, but it's forbidden to eat and to drink. That's really the same. And to uh, to wash, etc. Other things are also forbidden. Okay, negative commandment: not to do work on Yom Kippur. Positive commandment: to rest from work on Yom Kippur. Positive commandment: to make a special sacrifice on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Positive commandment: a positive commandment to rest from work on the first day of Sukkot. Uh, Sukkot is the holiday, and they call it, in, how do we call it in English? Tabernacles. Can't, not allowed to do any work on that day. To make a special sacrifice on the seven, seven days of Sukkot, seven days of tabernacles. Here we have three commandments, positive commandment, to not do any work on the eighth day of Sukkot, called Shemini Atzirat. Negative commandment, do not, well, what happened over here? Okay, not do, negative commandment, not to, to negative commandment, to, to not do work, refrain from work. Here's the positive command to rest, and the negative commandment to refrain from work. This is explained in another place. A positive commandment to make a special sacrifice on the eighth day of Sukkot. This might seem a little bit boring, you know, I mean, because we don't have a holy temple now, but we will soon. And not only that, this is also the will of God. Who would think that God wants a thing like this? But the fact is, He does, as we said so many times, who would think that God makes the nervous system so carp? complicated in the respiratory system and the endocrine system, but he does. That's what God does. But if we were God, we would make it much more simple and the whole world would fall apart. This is the way God decided. Okay. One of the things he decided is the Jews have to do all these complicated exact things in order to maintain the holiness in the world circulating. Positive commandment to <clears throat> take on the holiday of Sukkot the four types, right? The Lulav and the Etrog and the Hadas, Arava, positive commandment to sit in a sukkah for seven days, huh? to sit in a sukkah. So here we have all the holidays and a little bit of the commandments that are done and the holidays. And that is the end of the 63 commandments in this week's Torah portion. Next week is going to be Bahar. Now let's see this inside. Okay, come, let's see. Here we go. Here are the commandments we just learned from God. Before we learned from this great rabbi who brought down the conclusions of the rabbis. Now, it's a very interesting thing that God gave the Torah purposely in a way that demanded and required uh, interpretation. Because you cannot take the Torah at face value. Because if you take the Torah at face value, so someone will take it at a different face value. And everybody will explain everything, something different, whatever they want to. Right? The Ten Commandments. Don't kill. Maybe it means don't kill bacteria. Could be. It doesn't say one, no, don't kill people. <clears throat> it could be that it says you should rest on Shabbat. What does it mean, rest? Maybe you should just go to sleep. You know, and it doesn't say every Shabbat. It just says six days you should work. 
And you should keep Shabbat. So maybe just do it one time, you know, work for six days and then, you know, lay down for one, one day. And that's it. You did what it says in the Ten Commandments. And who knows what day it is? Who knows what rest is? Maybe resting doesn't mean that. Maybe resting means you need to drive your motorcycle or so therefore, the, the Torah purposely, God purposely gave the Torah so that the rabbis would interpret it properly. Why God did this, I don't know. But one thing for sure is that there's a commandment to learn the Torah properly. There's a commandment to learn the Torah properly. You just can't shoot off the first idea that comes into your mind and saying that I am holy and I am the chosen of the Lord and whatever I say is right. Because you have right, well, how many, eight other eight billion other maniacs doing the same thing. So everybody can just say whatever he wants. So therefore the rabbis met together and they argued. Maybe this, maybe it means that. And the one thing in common with all these rabbis is they were always, they were all God-fearing people. They really, really were afraid of doing what is wrong. They cared nothing about themselves going to hell. They did just wanted to do what God wanted. And they did not want to do what God does not want. That's what the whole Talmud is, to see these amazing, great, most of them had the power to raise the dead. <clears throat> so that's what we just finished learning. We just finished learning sort of the outcome, result, basically according to the Rambam. He was, the really, he was really great at this, of consolidating all the different opinions into one practical uh, way of looking at things. And there's, there's a lot of room for argument. There's a lot of room for argument in the Torah. There's a lot of room for different opinions, even in the final, but the, in, in the final run. But the main thing is that it has to be a person that's a God-fearing person. He really is really afraid of doing what's wrong. The same thing as people are afraid of drive, driving down the wrong side of the street or putting the wrong type of ethyl into their car or, right? You know, you're invited to, to uh, you know, to meet a boss. You want don't want to go in your, you know, dressed in your pajamas or in your swimming suit. You want to know what, how how to act properly, uh, how to eat properly, and how things are, how to eat properly at it. <clears throat> okay, so let's learn that. What we so we just learned from the distilled outcome of all of these interpretations of the Torah by these holy men. Like I said before, most of these men had the power to raise the dead. And most of them had the power to raise the dead. These are the, these are the ones that are disparagingly called the Pharisees. These were tremendously holy people. Tremendously holy people. I mean, they, like I say, most of them had the power to raise the dead. Almost all of them had more you know, magical, if you want to call it, powers than all these other guys in the other religions. <clears throat> okay, let's go. Shur or se otovet bano losish chatu biomechod. A ox and its child, or an ox or a sheep, it and its son should not be slaughtered on the same day, says Rashi, noeg ben akeva. The custom is not in the male shur oto, he and his son, it's she and her son. It's forbidden to slaughter a mother and the son or the daughter in the same day, or a mother and, you know, a cow and its mother, whatever. And it is not done in males. Males. And we just finished seeing that, that the commandment from the Torah is not, but the rabbis say you shouldn't, if you know for sure who the father is, then you shouldn't slaughter also the father and its son on the same day. It's permissible to set, slaughter the father and the son. So he brings down. But we just learned a little differently. It and its father, the Ramban talks about this in, in length. It says that he brings down, that's, the, that's Rashi's opinion. Excuse me, here's the Balaturim. Oh, excuse me, wow. Here's the Balaturim. <clears throat> Balatorim, Yaakov Balatorim. <clears throat> no, no, I made, I made a mistake over here. 
Okay, yeah, yeah, here we go. It says, um, it, it, Oto Bano, no, so, Ve et Bano, this is the numerical value of no. No, no, I'm sorry, what's that? What happened? Why, why? I must be, I must have the wrong balatorium over here for some reason. I, oh, yes, I do. I have the wrong balatorium. I'm sorry, I looked at the wrong place. Okay, let's go. The kisis b'chuzevachtoda, when you make a, a, a free will offering, a Thanksgiving offering, you have to do it with the proper intention. He says, what does it mean, the proper intention? We'll see. Namely what? That you have to slaughter with the intention that you are going to eat it on that day. You should eat it. Don't leave any over until the morning. I am God. And you should keep my commandments and do them. I am God. Do not disgrace my holy name. And that's the negative part. Don't disgrace. And you should sanctify my name among the Jewish people. I am God that makes you holy. Rashi, do not disgrace my holy name to transgress on my words on purpose. Says Rashi, Mimashma, this implies, Shenemar lo techalel, that you should not disgrace my name. Ma Talmud Lomer of Iniktashti. If it already says do not disgrace, why does it say that you should sanctify my name? Sanctify my name is the same thing as not disgracing my name, right? It says Moser Atzmacha that you should, you say that sacrifice yourself and make my name holy. Yochel Biyachid, you might think that even if you are alone, but right, somebody puts a gun to your head and says, eat this pork, or I'll put a ball through your head. <clears throat> so you might think, yes, I should say, kill me, I'm not going to eat it. Talmud Lomer says, betoch ben Israel. <clears throat> only when you are among 10 Jews. And that's referring, we said that's only in, in, a, in a private time, but if it's in a time where there's a, a, they're, they're like an inquisition or something, they're trying to make the Jews leave Judaism, then even on the smallest thing, you're supposed to give your life. Or if it's for these three big sins, which are called uh, forbidden sexual relationships or idolatry or, um, or killing somebody else, you're supposed to give your life rather than do those things. Now, when you give, if a person, a Jew, gives his life for God, let's say they say, worship this idol, it will throw you in the fire. So when you get thrown in the fire, don't do it in order to, to have a miracle. Do it, say, okay, you know, if you want to, you can kill me. I don't want to die. But more detestable than death is to worship idols. It says you should sacrifice yourself in order to give your life and not in order to be saved. That anyone who gives his life in order to be saved, in other words, he's not really serious about giving his life. He thinks that God is going to do him a miracle then if, if that's the attitude, then God won't do the miracle. So it's almost like the sort of, what do they call it, catch 22, but it's not. It's not. What does it mean? If you want the miracle to happen, it's not going to happen. It's, you might think that's a, that's a opposite, but it's not. Why not? Because what is what exactly is a miracle? A miracle means that God shows that he's the boss. God shows that he's the boss. So <clears throat> Giving your life for God means that you're saying that God is the boss. God, this man wants me to worship an idol, but God says that I shouldn't worship an idol. He says he's going to kill me if I don't worship an idol. So what can I do? You know, I'm, 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 I'm not going to worship an idol. That's all there is to it. You want to kill me, kill me. And you're not doing it to say, you'll see, God's going to save me from you, right? And then God doesn't do it. So it's a big disappointment. Everybody's going to say, here, God was supposed to save this guy. They didn't. A lot of times where there are the cases like this, they say, okay, we're going to burn you. Let's see if your God saves you. 
And the person says, listen, God saved Daniel from the lion's den because Daniel was a holy person. I'm not a holy person, right? I'm giving my life because I'm not at least, right? Maybe I'm not holy, but I'm not going to worship idols. So you want to kill me, you can kill me. So he's not doing it for the sake of a miracle. Shekin Matzino, we find this also, Bechanania, Misha, Vazaria, those were the three compatriots of Daniel, that they were thrown into a fiery first furnace and they, they were willing to be thrown into a fiery furnace, not because they believed that God was going to do them a miracle, because it says, hey, lo, lohu, malka. It says, we don't know if God is going to create save us or not. We don't know if God is going to save us or not. Yadiyah lahavi lach. Any knowledge of, is God going to save? They don't know. They're just saying, listen, one thing I know, we're not going to worship idols. That's all there is to it. You want to throw us into a fiery furnace, that's your business. If God wants to save us, that's his business. But we're not, we know one thing, to worship idols, we're willing to give our life. <clears throat> it's not that they say, I'm not going to worship idols, and you're going to see that I'm not going to have to make any sacrifices. God is going to save me. And essentially what that means is I'm not risking anything. Right? I'm not risking anything, God's going to. So you say, no, I'm willing to even give my life. Okay. This is the Bali Torah I wanted. This is the Gematria. This is the Gematria. That you do not say Kedusha less than 10 people. Okay. What does it mean to sanctify God's name? One big way of doing it is that the person says, you know, you can. I'm not going to bow down to an idol. Any normal person will bow down to an idol, right? Take the Pope, put a gun to his head, and say, you know, put on these tefillin, and say, Shema Yisrael, or we'll put a bullet through you. They'll do anything you want. What's the question, right? They'll do anything you want to save his life. What's the question? Here you take a simple Jew, and you say, bow down to this idol, and we'll, uh, or we'll kill you. He says, I'm not going to bow down to the idol. It's forbidden. I can't, I'm not going to do one motion to go against the Creator. That's what's called sanctifying God's name. That's one thing. There's another type of sanctifying God's name, which is much less risky, and that is praying. It says that when the Jewish people pray, they say a thing called Kaddish. Kaddish they also say Borchu. They say a lot of praises of God that can only be said by 10 people. So that's what he says. Kedusha, holy things, should only be said in 10, groups of 10. Right after that, it comes all the holidays. The holidays that all the Jews gather together and they what they sanctify God's name. That's what it says, I want to be made holy among the Jewish people. In other words, when the holidays come, gather a lot of people together in the synagogue and praise the creator of the universe. Because I took you out of the land of Israel, of Egypt. Wait, to be for you for a God. Why did I? What does that mean? In order to make you for a God. In other words, I took you out on Menat Cain. I took you out of Egypt in order that you would be willing to give your life rather than transgress my commandments. I am God. Don't worry about it. I will repay. Rewards. I do not remain a debtor. I will repay. A Sephorno, Rabbi Vadia of a Sephorno. He lived about like 700 years ago, something like that, six, seven years. I took you out of Egypt that I will be for you for a God. I will, I will lead you without any uh, middleman. Kamishpat and like holy people that go in the way of holy ways, they're directly connected to God. There's nothing in the middle. It says the ways of the non-Jews don't believe. The non-Jews, they believe in all sorts of people and all sorts of middlemen and connectors and things like that. And they pray to them. Listen, to have teachers is good. Every, you have to have Moses. If there wasn't no Moses, the Jews would never gotten out of Egypt. But nobody bowed down to Moses. Nobody worshipped Moses. Nobody said Moses was God. Right? Moses fed everybody in the desert for 40 years. 
Right? No one said that Moses was God. Al <clears throat> Goyim, don't learn to do what God says. The, 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 the signs of the heaven don't go after, don't, don't go after the stars of the sky. I am God, Loshaniti, I never changed. But as I come as, and I'm doing just like it did back then, but in the beginning of creation. And if you just wouldn't do sins that separate between you and me, you would see me. You would, you would be directly connected to me. Like it says, just like the days of you're going out of Egypt, I will show you miracles. And tomorrow we're going to learn about the different holidays. Now let's see one thing. I want to do one thing over here. Very good. Let me turn this off one minute. Here. One second here. And, and, oh, this this whole big business over there. Okay. Okay, my friends, let's turn this off. Don't go away. I want to learn Pirki Avot. We're going to learn Pirki Avot a little bit. Ready? Let's turn this off. Turn this off. Turn 